Podcast.com podcast. I am Nina Pantic, joined by a guest co-host, Matt Fitzgerald, and two very, very special guests, Bob and Mike Bryan. Do you want to tell us why you guys are in today? Yeah, we have a little announcement here um, at the Tennis Channel. We're going live with Courier and Brett Haber, and we're going to announce that 2020 is our final season. So U.S. Open 2020, we're going to zip up the rackets for the last time. And we're here in the L.A. studio, so Tennis Channel is going to be breaking the news, which is yeah. awesome. What led to this decision? What were the lead up, and how, how did we get here? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, last year Mike had a great year. I was out on the sidelines, and um, we had a little doubt if we were ever going to play together again. And it was it's been a you know whirlwind this year with me coming back and winning some titles with um, the hip, and we played a busy schedule. And after the Open, we wanted to just take some time, reflect – um, on the career and, and rest our minds and we thought uh, we'd want to strengthen our bodies right now for one last run. Uh, we're feeling healthy and we want to, you know, wrap up this uh, chapter of our life, you know, strong and really, really fighting and competing for titles. Um, we don't want to end our career on fumes. Well, speaking to that, Bob, how meaningful is it for you after everything you went through with your hip to be able to have a say in writing this final chapter? Yeah, I mean, um, I think had we together had the year that Mike had last year, we might have called it quits then, you know, and going out on top. But, um, you know, injuring myself um, last year in Madrid, you know, made me kind of think, let, let's try to rehab, let's have the surgery. And it gave me a new set of goals and new motivation to come back and, and finish this uh, on our terms the way we want. And um, we've decided now and we have clarity um, – that we're going to make the U.S. Open our last tournament in 2020. And it's great to have a finish line and in sight and something to really uh, push for. Do you have a clear schedule of what what tournaments you're going to be playing in 2020? Are you starting the Australian Open? Is there a plan? Yep, we're going to start um, at the Aussie Open. Um, we plan on playing, you know, the, the American tournaments, Indian Wells and Miami. Um, I think we're playing Delray. And we're still going to discuss, see how we're feeling uh, midway. Um, I don't think we're going to be playing every tournament at, um, at 42 years old, but we're going to um, pick the places where we have the, the most special memories. Um, we want to play all the slams. Um, and, yeah, just we just want to be healthy and feeling great so we can, um, you know, play with the energy and passion that we had when we were little guys and we were fresh on tour. We want to kind of have that spill out to the fans. Um, thank them for supporting us for, for all these years. Um, you know, we've really loved our time um, the last – 21 years on tour. I mean, we've spent half of our lives um, on tour and um, fulfilled all of our dreams and just had a, had a great time doing it together. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the plan for 2020. Um, and hopefully we can finish strong. We want to we wanna play hard. We're working um, pretty hard in the gym right now and uh, working on a few things in our game. And we don't want to limp across the finish line. We want to really um, play well. Well, to that, you guys made your pro debut at the 95 U.S. Open. Yeah. Doubles has gone through a crazy evolution through that time. Uh, there's been a scoring format change. A lot of teams are now playing behind the baseline. Is perhaps maybe coming through all of that to the other side and being the greatest of all time through those challenges maybe more significant than the records that you set in the process? Yeah, we've, we've actually never really – taking a chance to really look at the trophies and the stuff we've achieved. We've always kept our head down and, and really been um, pushing hard and forward, looking forward to the next thing to improve and uh, looking forward to the next workout. Um, yeah, doubles has, over the last 22 years, has really evolved. Um, when we came on tour, it was the Woodies. Um, they were chopping people up with their, um, their poaching and, the, and the, their finesse and just their expertise on uh, doubles. Then... Knowles and Nestor had an amazing partnership with uh, um, also another lefty-righty combination. And then in 2005, doubles um, looked like it could be the end. Um, there was a lot of rules that were taking, um, changed to, to get rid of the double specialist. Um, draws were going to be composed only of singles players. So um, that was a scary time. And we, we, with the help of some other doubles guys and my dad, uh, filed a lawsuit and um, we started doing some exhibitions around the country to raise money for the lawsuit and put an end to, the, to those rule changes. Um, and that's one of the things we're most proud about is uh, we were able to kind of turn the tide there and, and secure doubles kind of place in history, and, and here it is today, stronger than ever. Um, but with that, 
uh, came a few rules changes. And, you know, now the scoring's different. As you can see, it's two sets and a, and a super tiebreaker. And now the singles players can enter the doubles draw with their singles ranking. So with that um, change, uh, it changed the whole sport. Now you have uh, half the guys are serving and staying back and ripping ground strokes. And with the string and the technology, the returns are so powerful now that um, it's been a huge evolution in doubles. And um, just we, uh, within the last couple of years, it's been a, a really big shift towards I formation. Um, so very rarely do you see teams playing straight up conventional doubles like we used to see in the 80s and 90s. It's a guy on top of the net um, in the middle of the court. So we've had to adjust our game, um, you know, every year to, to, stay, to stay relevant. Is there maybe one player or a tandem along the way that really you would go to bed at night and say, I've got to get this player, I've got to get this team that pushed you to reach your peak level and actually hit a height that you maybe couldn't have imagined when you first started out? Yeah, I mean, Danny Nestor um, was one of the top players when we turned pro, and he spanned <laughs> our whole career. He retired last year at 46, and he had about – six or seven different partners that he was at top of the game with all of them. So he was the, the constant, um, amazing player, just awesome hands. He hit this lefty serve that you just could not read it. Uh, you just throw it up and he could shape it any direction and every, any spin. And he played with like very little emotion. So he could be down 6050. He's got the same expression um, if he's up 6050. He just had this like cold blooded expression. Um, and just super talented, always rose to the occasion. We played him in a ton of big matches. He, he broke our heart a few times. Um, I think we played him about 50 times, Bob. Was it 50 or? I think it was 61 times. Okay, 61 times. And I think it was 31 to 30. We actually we clipped him. edged him the last time, and, um, and then he, he retired, so he's got, we got him forever. But um, he's a, he was a great guy. I mean, everyone loved him on tour. Um, just one of the... He's actually one of the funniest guys in the locker room and one of the loudest guys in the locker room um, and one of the quietest guys on court. Never said a word. Okay. Let's talk about the new baby. There's going to be an addition to the yeah. family. Um, how is that going to impact 2020, the final year? I'm psyched. Um, the baby's due on my birthday, our birthday, um, April 29th, and uh, super excited to be a, a papa. Um, I think it's good timing, too. Um, I'm winding up the career next year, and... Um, it feels like Bob was up three sets and a break. He had three. Um, I've watched him raise his kids. He's done an amazing job um, balancing the tennis and the kids. And, um, yeah, I felt like I've learned a lot in the process, so I can try to apply that to my kid. Um, yeah, it's going to be just a, an amazing experience. I could see the love he has for his kids and um, the way he sees the world. It's, it's totally different, and um, I'm happy to be in that place uh, with him. And I think he'll kind of uh, – I can relate to him now. And, and see the, the struggle he has with balancing, um, putting everything in a tennis, but also putting everything into his kids. And it's, um, it's, I can see it's not very easy. He's got three guys under um, seven. Yeah. And they're running around, and they're crazy. I think, I think the kids, uh, it helps you just see uh, the world from a, a different place. It puts everything in perspective. You know, for so many years we've been going with our head down, worrying about the wins and the losses. And, you know, I think – with with a kid, there's it's just your life has a different purpose. Um, you'll see that, you know, when you come off the court after a devastating loss, and you know your boy's there to hug you and smile. He doesn't care if you win or lose. Um, so, yeah, you'll you'll I think you'll you'll see practices and matches a, a different way. Um, you you know you go hard in the practice. You give it as much intensity as you can, and then you you leave it. You leave your work life and you go home, and uh, you you spread the love. Yeah. Uh, were you uh, preaching to me a little bit? Yeah, just gi giving <laughs> just you a little heads up. <laughs> I, was, I was going to ask, Bob, do you have any, like, top three tips for a new dad on tour? Because there's a whole bunch of them that I've been, like, we've got Isner, yeah. we've got Query. There's a whole bunch of people having kids, and do you have your top three tips? I think you just go with the flow. You know, um, everyone's reading books on how to be the best parent, but everyone has their own style, I think, uh, if you if you just give them a lot of love, you, um, let them make mistakes and learn from them, uh, you'll you'll be fine. You know, we're my wife and I are are struggling every day trying to figure out, you know, the best the best way to raise our kids, and you know we're learning something each day. But um, yeah, everyone's gonna have their own style. But if you give them love, you give them time. Uh, I don't think you can go wrong. I want to make a big announcement really quick. Uh, 
So I went down to the Ventura County um, Courthouse to pick up my birth certificate because I needed it for um, Nadia's immigration process, get her green card. And um, on the birth certificate, it said twin, but it said second. And so for these 41 years, I've thought I'm the oldest twin. And I was told everyone that I'm two minutes older than Bob. Bob's actually officially <laughs> the older brother. For six so hours, I've known. <laughs> so but I've always known sh- I'm the big sh- dog. A shock to the family. system. My parents were surprised. We were all just in shock. So, um, yeah, the big boy, he, he outweighs me. He's taller, and that's because he came out first. Yeah. I always knew you were the little <laughs> biatch. <laughs> Your entire career, yeah. you guys didn't know that. It was wild. It was, it's a wild. Your entire life. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my parents messed it up. They, I guess they mix us up at birth. <laughs> I'm Bob. Maybe. I could be Bob. You want to switch our names, too? We could. It's not too late. Um, but yeah, that was wild. We were just looking at the birth certificate and it said second. We got to check yours though. What if you're second also? So we just got two number twos. What if it's, <laughs> what if it's the typo? Yeah. We'll Good. see. I'm going to, we're going to confirm with my birth certificate back in Miami. My wife's uh, digging, digging for it right now. Bob, I have to ask, you really set the gold standard on social media with Michaela all those years ago. A lot of People really look at what Serena's doing today, but the creative captions you had, um, are you going to look forward to maybe creating some time capsules in your final season now that you do have three kids who really understand what you do for a living? Yeah, that was, that was a blast. When it was just Michaela, uh, she traveled all over the world. And we had a lot of time on our hands. You know, one baby, as you're going to see, Mike, is pretty easy. Once you get to three and you're outnumbered, you're, you're screwed. But yeah, we, we love that Twitter. Um, she had like 13, 14,000 uh, followers and she was posting pictures or we were with, uh, you know, all the famous tennis celebrities and we had funny captions. It was, it was just a creative outlet for, for us during, during that time. But um, yeah, I'm going to look forward to just sharing, sharing these moments uh, with my family. I told Michaela, you know, the plans for retirement. She actually was crying and She's like, you can still go back. If you're retired, you can still come back and play, right? I'm like, yeah, but it's pretty final. So she she got emotional, which was a little sad. But um, I think she loves coming on the court after the matches and hitting the balls in the crowd. It's become like her routine. Um, but, yeah, they're going to come to as many tournaments as we can. We're going to share it as family. And then, yeah, we're just looking forward to, to meeting um, Mike's new little guy. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're picking can, out Can names. you give us a name? Yeah. Um, so it's between Luke or Jake or Blake. Well, you're going or, for the, the or, American, like, yeah. Midwest names. Yeah, uh, yeah. Nadia's going for a Slovakian name. country names. singer. <laughs> She's going to go for, like, Pietr or, <laughs> or uh, Magnus. That wouldn't sound good with the Brian last name. Pietr, <laughs> Brian? It just doesn't work. So we're going to keep it all American. You're going for Luke. She wants Lucas with a Z. Our kid's going to be eating a Cracker Barrel, Bob. <laughs> It is interesting though because your kids, Bob, have been your entire their entire lives. You've been a tennis player, yeah. but I think they'll realize quickly having you at home will be greater having you around. Yeah, no, uh, the the home routines, everything, just getting them in that, you know, school and after school activities. Right now, they're they don't have a routine. You know, we're we're out the door. We're in, just in the Bahamas for a charity event. It's a lot of fun, but I think most kids, you know, get like that routine and that stability which will be good for them, I think. Um, you know, then we can really start uh, chucking them balls, see if they like the tennis. Um, I, Michaela loves music. We'll, you know, ramp up the music lessons and see where they want to want to go. Well, speaking of music, the Brian Bros Band has been an integral part of your guys's kind of tour involvement in terms of helping to profile doubles away from the court. Are you going to playing some gigs as you ramp up uh, your final season in some of your favorite cities like uh, Cincinnati or in Indian Wells or Houston? Yeah, I mean, our two biggest gigs are the Houston gig and the Indian Wells gig. We've been doing those for over a decade now, and they've gained a little steam. Um, now Indian Wells at the food court, there's four or 5,000 people, and they're ready for it. Um, we try to add a couple new songs each year uh, just to keep them interested. But, um, you know, Jim Bogios from the Counting Crows is nice enough to join us on the road all the time. Uh, we just played a gig with James Valentine from Maroon 5. Um, his guitar licks are pretty sweet. And uh, we have fun with it. We've, we've always traveled with our instruments. 
it's a it's a great um, way to kind of get your mind off the off the rigors of the tour. And uh, we're always going to have that in our life. And uh, unfortunately, Mike's now living in California. Um, you have a place in Florida too. I don't want to out you. <laughs> I'm, I'm more Florida than California. Yes, probably. yes, that's right. <laughs> and um, so my jam buddy, um, after the tour is going to be, we're going to have to find ways to get together. And uh, he's my guitar guy. Um, so I need, I need, we need to find a way to keep the band together. But more, more music after tennis for sure. I remember, I want to say it was 2009, and I think I snuck into a bar in L.A. to watch you guys play. The Viper Room. The Viper Room, which is famous. Yeah. We're better now than we were then. And it was Let It Rip was the hit, <laughs> yeah. and I liked it. I oh, thought it thanks. was, I downloaded it on iTunes. Yeah. It was my first download. I paid for it, I think. No, you didn't. I think I paid a 99 cents for it. I, I was committed. I have 40 of those cents, probably. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for giving No, me no, we kept, we got 70, but we had to split it. <laughs> yeah. So but yeah, we, we thought we were going to be rock stars. We had our little album that we just recorded in L.A., um, put our heart and soul. We had a, a five-track um, EP, and um, it didn't tear up the charts. The gross but sales of that was 70 cents. Maybe it's because <laughs> I'm your only supporter. Well, there's a little-known song on, on there, a little track called Autograph. And um, at the time, it was um, Novak Djokovic and Annie Murray, but they weren't as famous uh, back then. They were, Federer and Nadal were taking the headlines. So we got them to, to actually rap on this song. It's pretty funny. And, and now here they are, big, we should re-release it. Yeah. Then maybe we'd make more than 70 cents. 20th anniversary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I think you guys <laughs> can get all. whatever you want in this farewell tour. You guys can yeah. yeah, yeah. re-record maybe and get a little Rafa, or maybe there's somebody else that can sing, but you guys could probably. We got some new material. Yeah. yeah. I think we're better now. It's been 10 years. I was at the Viper. I was bluffing. I think I had my guitar turned off, so I was playing air guitar. So I looked like I was a rock star, but I was... No. <laughs> is that true? No. No. <laughs> I, was, I was playing chords, knocking solo. Good for yes. you. In terms of the farewell tour, when you look at each tournament you're going to... Now we're back to tennis, I'm sorry. When you look at the, each tournament you're going to, the slams, what's your favorite memory from, like, the Australian Open? You think, what could top this top memory? What was your favorite moment? For, it's for sure the 2006 match we played against Dam. And Leander Paez, we had lost in the year, um, bef the two years before, 04 and 05. We came in and had, had never won there. Third year in a row in the finals, and we're in a barn burner. I think the women's match, there was a walkover, or the match went quick. So it was a full house. Um, place was rocking. We were doing chest bumps. They were doing chest bumps. <laughs> it was uh, it was weird. And then Mike was down, I think, seven or eight break points in the, in the final set on a serve. Battled through it. There was a big point where I, I did like a no-look volley behind Leander. Um, there, there's nothing that can top that moment um, winning our first one. And uh, it was our third Grand Slam at the time. And then later that year, we won uh, Wimbledon, which completed the career Grand Slam. So it was a stepping stone to, to getting all four. Um, but it's it's been our most successful slam. I mean, nine out of ten years we made the finals. We always kind of came into Australia with, with hope of a new season. We had worked hard in the off season. You know, we – very rarely took days off um, once the season was over. We were always running in the gym and, and practicing together, which helps. Um, I always have the number one player in the world um, down the hall. I can knock on his door and we can go out there and have a, a great practice. So um, we always came into Australia really sharp. The U.S. Open, you guys have firmly stated here today that it is going to be your final tournament no matter what. Um, tons of memories to pick from there. Your last Grand Slam title as a team happened to be your 100th. Um, what are you going to enjoy most about Flushing Meadows outside of it being kind of the last hurrah? What is it about New York, the fan experience, being on a big stage where tennis really is the center for those two weeks in the U.S.? Yeah, we played our first U.S. Open in 1995. We won Kalamazoo as 17-year-olds, and we were 130 pounds. So I remember walking into the credential office and saying, hey, we're, we're here. We're at the U.S. Open. And they're like, what are you doing? The, the ball kid's um, <laughs> office is behind. Like, go, uh, go sign up for being a ball kid. Go get your uh, coupons. Yeah. Um, and they wouldn't give us our badges until the actual draw came out. So we had to wait for the draw to be released because we didn't look like tennis players. We actually got kicked off the practice court like two or three times. Um, but we were just watching every match. We were actually getting autographs in the locker room, which is a no-no. Um, so we were just so excited to be. We just had wide eyes looking up at the stadiums. Couldn't believe it. It was before Arthur Ashe was there. So it was just Louis Armstrong, played the um, current USTA president, 
Patrick Galbraith. That shows how old we are. Um, and lost first at 6-0, and I think we're down a break, and we got a couple games, and we're just stoked. Um, but, yeah, now 25 years later, we played our 25 um, uh, Opens, and now we're playing 26 next year, and it's just changed. It's the granddaddy of all the slams. I mean, the stadiums are huge. The place has expanded. Um, I mean, for us, being an American, it's our favorite slam. The, the fans are just off the charts. Just They just bring the energy every time. Um, so to go out there, that's where we want to do it. Um, some of our greatest memories. We've won five Opens. Um, so, yeah, we want to – we want to play well there, but you know, we're uh, we're looking we're looking forward to going back to New York and um, and shutting it down there. Just one quick follow up um, along the lines of that autograph theme. It's yeah. obviously a lot different in 2020, but is there anything you guys might be looking to collect along the way from fellow players? You know, other sports people exchange jerseys, kind of give little tokens or trinkets along the way. Is there that? Is that a component that maybe would help um, kind of bring this all together? Yeah, I mean, we're historians of the game. Um, we have lots of stuff, you know, memorabilia framed and draws and towels. Like, we're big towel stealers. Um, <laughs> Wimbledon, we've hurt them for <laughs> thousands of towels. Um, we've hurt their bottom line. But, yeah, you know, look, we're, we're always keeping stuff that's going to, you know, bring back the memories. Um, I have a closet full of rackets from – Big matches, um, you know, Federer was actually very nice to sign a bunch of rackets for a charity event last year. And, you know, all those all those players out there, Rafa and Fet, they're always willing to help out um, stuff for our foundation. So, we're, we're, yeah, we're collecting stuff. and But a lot of times we're, now we're, we're using it at, at uh, auctions to raise money for, for kids. You guys are always kind of considered as a tandem and a duo, but there was a period where you were playing apart. And I kind of on that note want to ask um, Mike, What's the most proudest moment you've been where you, what's the proudest you've been of, of Bob, of your brother? What you well, thought, like, we weren't well, playing uh, a part because I was on the couch. Yeah. I mean, I, I was proud stitches. of the way Bob um, handled everything. I mean, I jumped in my first Grand Slam or my second without him and ended up winning it, which was kind of a shock. Um, and he was the first to call and I could, I could actually hear he's happy for me. Uh, when I think most brothers could be Baking it. jealous. They might have been bluffing. <laughs> but um, the way he just worked his butt off to come back and um, spent hours and hours in the gym and went through, like, a risky surgery, and um, it took. I mean, he uh, came back into this year um, not as f quickest, I would say. You, you weren't that fast down in the yeah, yeah, five but months is but still working on it. By, uh, by March, he was back to full speed and, and moving just as well as he had. And we won Miami, which is um, a kind of a shock. He inspired Andy Murray to have the same surgery. He was talking to him every day, and now Andy's won a tournament. So he's blazed the trail for um, hip, uh, what do you call those, prosthetics? <laughs> um, yeah, RoboCop. <laughs> Iron Man. Yeah. Um, but it, it's just great that we can um, go out together. So I'm, I'm proud of the way he handled me, um, you know, lighting up the tour without him and finishing number one. Thanks. <laughs> that can't have been easy. <laughs> Being really nice to me today. Um, it's an emotional day. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't easy being on the couch, not knowing if you're ever going to play, and then watching your, your bro who you shared every record with um, pull ahead. <laughs> pull, <laughs> pull ahead. But Mike was great. I mean, he, if he was cocky, I would have just buried him, you know. Yeah. But he, he was pretty humble about the whole thing, and – you know, it was clear about the fact that we were, he was going to wait for me and try to, you know, play this, this season together. But, um, yeah. Well, because Thank at you. no point, at no point would you have ever wanted to play a part. At no point in your career did you guys even consider it, no. trying different partners? No, we never, um, we never once um, considered breaking up and, and looking for another partner. We've had, you know, so much heart heartbreak during our career, and we remember those, those more than the wins sometimes, and you know, 14 Grand Slam finals we've lost, and those are, you know, those are tough. You know, you, you walk around like a zombie for a week after one of those. and uh, But, yeah, not once did we go talk about it with someone else in the locker room or another player or look over our shoulder and, you know, try to find a greener pasture. It's all, it was always a package deal. We were, we were sticking, sticking it out. And um, so happy that we're going to be able to retire together. You know, that's what we started together. It's, you guys have left a lasting impact on the game, not just doubles, everything. How will anyone ever, how will the game survive without you? Have you, 
it's you know, be, it's, it's almost like do better. fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're only as good as your last match, and they uh, they're, they're quick to forget. Um, <laughs> we've been off the tour, and the tour's doing just fine right now. Um, yeah, tournaments I mean, are happening. You know, <laughs> but the records, the records, I yeah. think cannot. There's no way. 118. Yeah, we've been titles. We've been lucky to stay slams. healthy and and you know to to play this many tournaments and and to win a little bit and uh, to do it together for this many years and tennis has been really good for to us we're grateful um if we've left a little mark um, or we've left the campsite cleaner um that was my dad's quote uh, i had to throw that in there um then we're happy you know so yeah look, look we're we're very blessed to, to have it go like this where do you hope doubles will go in the years that you guys are are, are not playing when you look in 10 years how do you hope it to because sometimes it's frustrating to see doubles get a little bit pushed out of the spotlight yeah. scheduling wise money wise everything yeah. i mean look singles has the spotlight um has the prize money and um you know the casual sports fan is watching singles the, the hardcore tennis fan watches doubles um you know sometimes you know they can get in a trend where you know you need to reset it i think 2005 there was that that time where we needed to kind of um, check uh, what was going on at the top of the game and, and figure it out. And doubles is doing great now, and we're very happy with the, the trajectory of it. And we'll just keep our eye on it. And if there's something we can do to give it a, a, a little boost down the road, we'll we'll be the first ones there to to do a clinic or do an appearance and try to um, try to help out. You know, because we love we love the sport. It's 2021. What are you looking forward to most to be able to do? Um, I mean, we've pretty much been on a plane every week for the last uh, 21 years. So maybe wake up in my own bed for more than um, five days in a row and um, check my sleep tracker and see that I got eight hours of sleep. A good <laughs> sleep would be nice. Um, yeah, I mean, we're always, our minds are always churning to try to figure out ways to get better. I'm always like, okay, right after this podcast, we got to go hit some balls, Bob, because, you know, we got next year. Maybe, like, put the rackets in the closet for a little while and just freshen up. Um, and then just be with our families, and I'm going to have a baby. I'm going to be changing a lot of diapers. Probably won't be getting that eight hours of sleep, eight hours of sleep, and there's no way. Yeah, um, plan on the tour is like having a, like a homework assignment due. Yeah. Um, you're always thinking about that paper that you got you got to work to do. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it's nice to go on a vacation and not have, like, a price tag attached to it, you know. You take four days off, you lose a little cardio, you know, you lose a little strength. You're always thinking about – who's working while I'm enjoying life. So uh, that price tag uh, um, will go away, which will be nice. Should we let you guys go to practice? Yeah, let's, let's go. go. Let's go work. Okay. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us. This is awesome. Great to be here. Thanks, guys. Thanks.